everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, a podcast where we reach into the core of the .NET technology stack and, with the help of the .NET community, present you with the information that you need in order to grok the many moving parts of one of the biggest cross-platform multi-application frameworks on the planet. I am your host, Jamie Gaprockman taylor and in this episode, I talked with Justin Barnett about building virtual reality applications in .NET using the Unity game engine. Along the way, Justin talks us through how you can get started in VR development without having to spend thousands of dollars on equipment. He also talks us through some of the most innovative and exciting VR applications he has tried out. So let's sit back, open up a terminal, type in .NET New Podcast, and let the show begin. So first thing I'd like to say, Justin, is thank you ever so much for being on the show. Um, it is a great pleasure to talk to someone who knows all the things about VR, and I know nothing about VR, and I'm always interested to meet new developers anyway, so thank you ever so much. Yeah, thank you for having me on. I would say I know all the things, but we'll see how far we get. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know infinitely more than me, so in my eyes, you're the expert, right? <laughs> yeah, there we go. We'll That's call it that. We could, we could say expert for the sake of the show. <laughs> I'll exactly. take that title. Expert for a given value of expert. That's what yeah, it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very narrow band of knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So um, I was wondering, uh, could you, for the listeners, just give us a brief introduction to like the work you're doing or maybe how you discovered how you discovered VR and things like that? Just a little yeah. bit about you sort of thing. Sure thing. Yeah, I'm Justin Barnett. I go by Justin P. Barnett on all the socials um, because Justin Barnett is a fairly common name, I found out. Um, but I mainly do a YouTube channel about virtual reality development tutorials. So I mainly develop in Unity, which is C-sharp based. And through that, I kind of teach how to make virtual reality applications and games and that kind of thing. Um, it's... I found throughout, like, when I was first start getting into virtual reality, like, there were no good tutorials. There was, like, maybe one or, like, two other guys who do virtual reality tutorials, but they're all really outdated, and Unity up likes to update things, you know, every single quarter, so it's a different thing you have to learn every single time you want to, you know, do a new um, mechanic or something like that, so I was just struggling through trying to learn how do I code virtual reality? Because I, I think it was at five below at one point, And I found one of those super cheap, you know, like strap on your head, virtual reality headsets that were like, you just plug your phone into it. And, uh, it's, it's like the Google cardboard, I guess, except five below's version. And, uh, it was like, you know, a couple bucks and I put it on. And the first thing I remember watching was I just like looked on YouTube and found a 360 video and I was like, I just need to find something that I can actually like, you know, use this thing with. And it was a, it was like a safari video. And in it, this tiger walks right up to this 360 camera. And so I'm sitting in the chair looking around and I look behind me and there's just like a tiger, like sitting right there, you know, a couple <laughs> feet from me. And it was mind blowing because it's like nothing I've ever experienced before. Like you don't get the whole you know, vision that you like you normally do in um, real life, but I mean a good ninety degrees of your vision is filled up with this experience. This um, it's almost like an IMAX movie, but you can move your head and like it's it's a crazy experience if you've never you know had that before. Like your first VR experience, I feel like everyone always remembers their first VR experience because it's absolutely mind blowing. But that was my intro to it, and that kind of got me hooked. I was like, oh, okay, well, now I have to, you know, figure out what other, what else can I do with this? Or like, what other applications out there, like, that I can get into? And uh, when I was, I was looking around and it was like, virtual reality has been an idea and even like a, a thing for a good little while now. It's been, um, since like the 1990s was when they first, like, you know, came out with like for VR prototypes and whatnot. But then, getting into like nowadays, like it still really hasn't come that far. It still feels very, like, you know, gimmicky, I guess. And the, uh, so it was like, 
all the things that there are is like games and it's like just like you know video games that you can play and i was like i, I want to find like something with a little more substance to you know to be able to like because like there's a lot of arcadey games you can play it's just like you know there's beat saber which is a pretty big one right now and um there's a few other but there's not like a you know business application or like anything like that so um I was like looking into like how I, I wanted to like, you know, develop something that's a little more, has a little more substance. So I, my idea came about, I want to do like an education platform. Like what if like, like, have you ever seen the magic school bus? Yeah. The, so my idea was like to do the magic school bus, but like in VR. So like, it like you get to you know go experience, like they had all these experiences where it would be like, okay, well we're going to go um, and like, talk about like blood cells or whatever. So they go inside of like the bloodstream and they like, see all the cells and get to like have that up close and personal kind of interaction with that. And so I, I love that idea. I was like, what if I can just transform that into a virtual reality experience that people could have? Um, and I would love to like, you know, transform the education and with everyone working from home now and kids going to school from home, it's, it would be a game changer to be able to have your kid, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning when you have to like, you know, hook them up to a zoom call. Instead of doing that, you put put them in a VR headset and they're like sitting in this virtual classroom and their teacher shows up and you can see all the other students, virtual avatars. And then the uh, teacher says, okay, today we're talking about, you know, the Roman Coliseum and he snaps his fingers and the classroom melts away. And now the entire class is standing inside of the Roman Coliseum. And it's like, okay, this, this is pretty cool. <laughs> like your assignment for today is to go talk to this gladiator, go talk to, uh, you know, one of the Roman citizens and like, go talk to like, the, go find the Roman emperor and like talk to him. And like, you, you get this like, you know, real world experience that you're, you're not really going to forget in like too long. Like instead of, listening to a teacher drone on and like give a lecture and whatnot. Anyway, that's, a, that's a long way of saying <laughs> that, uh, that was my uh, intro to VR and kind of a little bit of the direction that I'm headed. I love it. I love that. Um, that idea of like making almost like making that education real and making it sort of magical. Um, Long-term listeners will and listeners to other shows that I do will know that um, in a previous career I was a, a teacher for a little while at, high, at a high school, and I tried my best. You know that, that was kind of what I tried to do, but obviously there's only so much you can do without the technology, right? Right. But, but I found that if you were able to make the 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 thing seem real. Right. So I was teaching high school math. Right. And high school math, you've got Pythagorean theorem, you've got geometry and you've got all of these things that almost everyone will say at some point in their high school career. Why do I need to learn this? Right. Because right. oh, all yeah. you're learning is here is a triangle. Here's how you work out the sides. Right. Whereas I was like, okay, so imagine you are Greek and you are living in ancient Greece and you're tiling the floor and there's a triangle bit left. How much of the tile do you need Ooh, to get to fit you. into that slot, right? Rather than here is a triangle. That is the hypotenuse. You do this divided by that times this. But do you know what I mean? That's kind of learning it by Clever. rote is kind of boring, right? But it, I mean, it never, it never, it never uh, really caught on because they were too busy <laughs> playing, you know, sneaking their PSPs into class and playing. Oh that. yeah. But, there you go. But yeah, um, the, the, there is something that you brought up there about VR. And uh, yeah, I think the commercial side of it, as an outsider, the commercial side of it, definitely in the 90s. But what I'd like to do, um, I'll put a link into the show notes, but what I'd like to do is I'm going to share a link with a chat system that we're using for a VR headset that was built in 1968. And I'd like you to watch the 22 seconds of it and tell me what you think. Um, for the listeners, it's called the Sword of Damocles, um, and it's it's pretty cool. That is quite a device he has on his mm -hmm. head. <laughs> Holy cow! It's like <laughs> hold it up against his head so that it moves with him. That's crazy. Yep. Nineteen sixty six is when this 66, came out. Sixty six. All right. Yeah, yeah. But Holy this was cow. this was back when it was in its research stages. Um, I only know about that because there's another show I do uh, called Waffling Tailors, and we interviewed a guy. 
um, uh, Sean Haas, who does a show called The Hist- the Advent of Computing. And he brought a whole bunch of VR and AR stuff onto the show. And was like, okay, so you've got to know about this, right? Um, full color uh, plasma screens in 1970. But they made them because they needed them. But they didn't have a commercial way of selling them. Wow. So they didn't get sold until the early 2000s. Uh-huh. It was amazing listening to that. But yes, um, so for the people who, obviously for the listeners, um, the device that the gentleman in the video has is kind of like, you know, the big apparatus you get at the when you go to the optometrist. It's kind of like that, uh, but it projects things in front of the person who's using it on screen. I guess kind of how VR works, but in less fidelity. Is that right? <laughs> in black and white. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, coincidentally, the Oculus Quest 2, which is like 20% of the market share of VR headsets right now, it came out last year, I'm pretty sure. Um, but it, when it, there's a camera system that projects the outside world that you're in into like the screen so you can see them, and that projects in black and white into your, onto the screen. So a little nod back to the old days, I guess. Maybe that's it. I do- <laughs> yeah. I do know from back when I was at university, they were building, um, they were building a, a VR suite. We never got to play in it, but they were building a VR suite. And the, the professor who was building it, uh, was saying that, um, the way that it, the way that they were building it was right on the edges of your peripheral vision. You are actually colorblind. Oh, no, he said colorblind. What he meant was you see, you perceive it in black and white and your brain colors everything in. And the no, the way that he knows this is he would have lights. Now I'm holding up my hands like roughly where my peripheral vision is. And he would have lights that would flash different colors, uh, just like LEDs or whatever, you know, not very bright LEDs. And he would have the research students try to tell him which color they were. And every single time before looking, they get it wrong. And they look across, oh, it's a red LED. And then he continued to look forward. And it, yeah, red, 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 because the brain was filling in with the information they previously had. Oh, wow. So maybe it's related to that. I don't know. That is interesting. There's there's some commercial headsets. It's the Vario, V-A-R-J-O, I think is how it's spelled. But they are doing a thing where you're like the right in front of you vision is a really concentrated like 4k image and then your peripheral vision they're doing like a lesser like 1080p almost like a little bit hazy blurry um so like the closer in you get the more high definition the pixels are and whatnot um which is pretty smart and they they say it's the i don't know what their term for it is but it's like the same graphics that you see in pretty much um sure. so which is gonna be super cool mm-hmm. if i can never get my hands on a sixty five hundred dollar <laughs> vr headset <laughs> that would be amazing yeah i, I mean that kind of makes sense right why why waste uh waste is such a the, the wrong term right but if you're building essentially two small wraparound screens why have all of the expensive parts of the screen where you're never gonna look right exactly like, how often do you, like, look all the way to the left or all the way to the right without actually moving your head, like, with mm-hmm. just your eyeballs? And so having that in a VR headset doesn't really, you know, make sense if you have the capability of, you know, concentrating. Like, why don't we concentrate all of the good hardware in the center and then we can leave the outer to, like, just good enough, you know? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep, I agree. Okay, uh, so one of the things that we, we've talked a lot about VR so far, we haven't really said what it is, but I think we can assume that maybe some of the listeners will know what it is. But what I'll say is, um, we've already discussed AR, so augmented reality, uh, back in episode 64 with Lee Engelston, but we haven't really discussed what VR is. Uh, I know that it stands for virtual reality. I know that when I was at university, they were building a VR lab. But that's really all I know about it. So I was wondering, could you tell us, I mean, do you have a personal definition of what VR is? Or do you just go with what everybody says it is? And do you know if there is a difference between VR and AR? There is uh, actually a little bit of a debate in the uh, virtual reality world about what constitutes a fully virtual reality application. So in like traditional sense, Virtual reality is a fully encompassed, like, virtual world. So augmented reality, you know, will have a 
semi-transparent glass in front of you that you can see through and it projects things over top of that. Same with mixed reality. So mixed reality can also, mixed reality is basically augmented reality plus it recognizes objects within your world. So if I'm sitting here and there's a door in front of me, it'll know there's a door and it can project someone, you know, on the other side of the door and like the door will like cut it off if the door is like halfway open, that kind of thing, as opposed to augmented reality, it'll just kind of paint over the door and like whatever, it doesn't really recognize whatever is in your space. Um, but virtual reality is, you know, you're fully in, you can't see anything of the real world at the moment. And then if you're doing it right, you have like noise canceling headphones on too. And then you're, you're like fully immersed but then there's different levels of immersiveness. So now they have haptic rigs that you can put on that give you the feeling of being in a virtual reality. So if you get like shot in the chest or something, it'll just kind of like give you a little haptic feedback in that spot, which is really cool. And they, so they're developing it for the, they have a chest and back rig and like arms and stuff. And then the but the real the real debate is so you you can go like crazy you can be on a virtual reality treadmill so when you walk you walk in the virtual reality world fully immersed kind of like ready player one if you've ever read that book mm -hmm. crazy kind of stuff but people argue like okay well was the 360 safari tiger video that i saw actual virtual reality because i wasn't really like they're interacting with the world i was just kind of you know, passively experiencing it in a 360 video. I couldn't even, like, if I moved my head to the left or right, I wouldn't even be able to move it, like, you know, positionally inside of the video. It's like mm -hmm. I'm set in a, it's only three degrees of freedom, not six. And so people argue with you, is that actual virtual reality? But then I could go the other way and say, our phones are a virtual reality. And anything that you do on your mobile device or even on your computer PC um, is a virtual reality that you're experiencing and living in. It's not fully, fully encompassing your like, you know, peripherals and your senses, but it's a virtual space that you're living in. And so could be a virtual reality. So it's, it's kind of wild, like how far that definition can flex back and forth, but my definition is basically anything that when like when you put on a headset it fully blocks out your your view that's kind of my standard go-to definition for virtual reality cool okay so we're not talking um i wonder whether this is a reference that would that would land or not we're not talking uh minority report with you know the gloves and the, the the fake screen that's not in front of you that's more mixed reality right yeah yeah i would i would say that would be mixed reality or even augmented reality at a certain point okay just like overlaying your real world yeah in the okay. virtual reality like you can go anywhere do anything be in space like that kind of stuff it's and I think that's why I'm more leaning towards the virtual reality side of development as opposed to the augmented or mixed reality side of development because the virtual, like, I, there's unlimited possibilities. I can do crazy stuff, whereas, I mean, arguably mixed reality and augmented reality have more practical applications. The virtual side of things just, you know, gets me more excited. So that's the route I'm going. <laughs> Follow sure. the excitement. Sure, that makes sense. You could... You could with a, uh, I'm saying like with a virtual reality, you could maybe like experience a walk along the Great Wall of China or indeed experience walking on the moon. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll be it just visually or maybe with one of those haptic feedback devices and a treadmill. Whereas like a mixed reality might be a, okay, here's part of the wall and you can reach out and touch it. But as soon as you do, your hands will go through, you'll fall flat on your face, and everyone will point and laugh at you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, so uh, let's talk about... So, uh, you see, I'm a .NET dev, um, and the majority of the people who listen to this are .NET devs. You talked about Unity earlier on. I know that Unity has... You can add C-sharp scripts to it. But is Unity the way that I need to be going? If, if I woke up tomorrow and said, you know what, Justin was right. I want to make a VR application for my virtual reality headset, whatever model it is, for my mobile phone, whatever. Um, do I start with Unity or can I 
can I maybe do something with .NET or is it, do, do I have to go with Unity? Like what's, what's the path I can take, right? Well, anything you develop in virtual reality is going to be like almost you, you, you got to think about it like you're developing a video game because it has all of those 3D graphic elements and visual effects kind of things to it. So essentially you could think of it as like you're developing a video game with very specific types of input. So instead of having a joystick and controller or a mouse and keyboard that you use to move your character and look around, you are actually doing it with a head-mounted display and controllers plus whatever other extra haptic rigs and stuff that the player will have on. So when you develop for, you know, video games like that, 3D video games, you need a game engine plus your code base. So the game engine will allow you to add game objects onto the into the world essentially so you you can add lights and you can add players and you you add, you add the ground and you anything that you visually see in the world will get added through that game engine and then you attach scripts to the game engine and then that's what you know performs all the actions and does all the goals and achievements and anything else like that um, I use Unity, which is a C sharp based game engine. Um, and it's free open source. And there is a, another one that is like Unity and Unreal or Unreal Engine is the other one. And those are like neck and neck, top of the line. AAA companies use them. Unreal Engine is known for its better graphical quality, good looking stuff. But since I have no um, artistic talent at all, <laughs> I, well, I go the Unity route because uh, C Sharp was what I kind of learned in college, and Unity is C Sharp, and Unreal Engine is C plus plus based. But if you're more of a artist or um, visually like inclined you can do you can go that route and do c plus plus coding or unreal engine has a visual scripting language so it's node based you can just drag and drop if statements and all the stuff that you need so you don't actually know need to know how to code or what the syntax is or anything like that you can as long as you know the logic structure you can make a game in unreal engine and i think unity still unity has plugins and stuff you could do that with too um, Un- Unreal has it built in though. Um, and then the notable mention, I guess, would be Godot is another um, game engine, but I haven't really dabbled in it, so I, d- I can't say uh, how good it is or not. But I do know it, it does support virtual reality development as well. Cool. Okay. So as a dev, I have a number of options. That's that's always good to know. I, I mm-hmm. like um, one of the, in my personal opinion, one of the great things about .NET going cross-platform is that I'm no longer tied to one specific operating system, right? If because like uh, at the time when they were when there was grumblings of we're going to make .NET cross-platform, I was I still am. I mean, I'm using a Windows machine right now, but uh, my daily driver is a as an Ubuntu-based computer, right? And I've got a mm-hmm. Mac OS. I've got a Mac somewhere in the house as well. So like back then, I was like, well, how am I going to do my .NET stuff at home? I want to do .NET stuff, but I can't. And I had to look into right. like. Um, the, the, there was this crazy build system that I had for producing um, a, it was a .NET framework application that would run in um, Mac OS, but had with a Windows Forms idea and had icons and all that kind of stuff. But it took about 25 minutes to build. And I'm like, I can't be oh doing goodness. this. This is no good. But That's ridiculous. I, yeah, yeah. But, but what I really like is having all of those options, right? Because... Like you say, if you want to get started, and uh, I think you said that Unity is uh, free to start with, and mm-hmm. if you know C Sharp, it's right there, right? Exactly. You want to go down the, the route of Go, you want to learn Go, or rather G Script, and do Go Dot, you can go that way. Or if you, presumably, if you know C Sharp, or you can get your head around the, the visual builder, you can go down the Unity route, right? There's, there's lots of different paths, right? Because that's what I don't like. I don't like being hemmed into one. I've got one choice. Because invariably, you'll always find. Oh, right. Okay. So how do I do particle effects? And you'll know, Google that particle effects in Unity. Uh-huh. Go, okay. Particle effects in, in Unreal. <laughs> exactly. Change my query. Go. <laughs> particle effects in Unreal. <laughs> <laughs> I've considered swapping back and I actually started in Unreal Engine, but once I got to the actual, you know, coding bit, 
the visual scripting language is good, but you know, I'm just a coder at heart. So I needed to do that. And I didn't want to learn a whole new language in order to develop VR stuff because this is my side job. I, it, my, I still have a full-time job doing, um, you know, .NET development at, at my nine to five. But so I didn't want to learn a whole new language. I just want to use the stuff I already have and want to be able to jump into it. So I ended up going with Unity. But a lot of the stuff that I researched and one of the big reasons why I started making this YouTube channel is because all the stuff was either outdated Unity stuff or it was for Unreal Engine, which I couldn't use because it's C Sharp and different language and like the, the platform has different integrations and stuff. So it just didn't work so i just had to you know figure it out go to the go to the documents <laughs> uh, yeah i've always hated that when when everything you find is outdated and i'm like well how does that help <laughs> right and, and the danger of learning a new language for a side project is if i'm learning a new language and a new tool and i'm doing something completely new well that's three possible things that could go wrong right uh-huh and and if I get a syntax error, okay, I can look that up. But if there's a tool chain error, or if there's some esoteric error because my line endings in my file are wrong, I'm not going to know what that means. I, I may as well nuke and pave my computer and start again. <laughs> right? Exactly. So I'm totally with you with not learning a new language to do a new project on a new thing, a new technology. I'm totally with you on that. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I want to be able to just have to learn the SDK. I don't want to actually need to like learn the language and the syntax and all that kind of stuff, which actually unity is just last month or two really like released a 1.0 version of like a baseline SDK. So used to, you had to do an Oculus SDK and then you had a steam SDK for the valve index and then you had, or the HTC Vive. And then the Valve Index had a different SDK, and then Windows Mixed Reality had a different SDK. So you had to almost develop for like as if you were developing for the you know PlayStation and for Xbox kind of mentality, like two completely different platforms. But it was like every single headset had to if you were, if you wanted your game to be played on that headset, you had to develop for a different SDK, which was ridiculous. But Unity just came out with a. SDK called Open X, Open XR, and it um, is like one baseline. Like you can hit all the other; it'll feed on all the, all the rest of them, which is so nice. So I only have to develop for like one thing now, which is good. But also means that all the other tutorials are outdated. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you you end up googling for let's say that particle physics stuff again, right? You want to do mm -hmm. this thing where you raise your hand to fire a fireball. You need to do particle physics for that. You Google for that and it's like, okay, so put the HTC Vive uh, uh -huh. SDK in and type these, the, the type in this code and this won't work on anything else. And you're like, well, that's not useful exactly. for me. <laughs> it's like each SDK has like a little different way of picking up objects and like making the hand move and all this kind of stuff. And it's all different. And um, I love developers or YouTubers who put outdated in the title of the video if they uh, have like know that their old stuff is outdated because that is so helpful when I'm like trying to debug and like going through YouTube or um, Stack Overflow and trying to figure out something. When I see the outdated tag, I'm like, oh, thank God, I don't have to just, like <laughs> dive into that rabbit hole. <laughs> that saves me 25 minutes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. So let's say we're using Unity and we're going to develop something in VR. Um, so what kind of hardware do I need? Do I need the expensive? I, I'm guessing the, the Oculus Rift is going to be the sort of middle of the road. Do I need the expensive hardware you mentioned earlier on? Do I need the, uh, the Oculus? Do I need, I mean, does a HoloLens even count? I feel like that's mixed reality, but <laughs> like which bits of hardware do I need? And do I need a super powerful computer with like 12 t bajillion uh, gigs of RAM and uh -huh. a thousand CPU cores or something? What are, what am I talking to be able to power this, this device? Well, there's, th I, I go with three different categories of headsets. So you have the, uh, you know, normal, like your phone can act as a headset. So if you wanted to absolutely start from scratch and didn't want to spend a lot of money, you can use your phone as a 
device to, you know, develop and test on. But the problem with that is you only have three degrees of freedom. So you have all the rotational axes, but you don't have any positional movement. So if you move your body around in your inside of the room, your character is not going to move around in the game, which is a little disorienting when you uh, first get started. Cause like you take a step over, but you, you, you don't in your like visual range and it's kind of weird. Um, but you could do that. And actually, Unity has a virtual virtual reality device that you can control with a mouse and keyboard, too, if you wanted to go that route, um, which is completely free. And you don't even need a nice like phone or whatever. But then the uh, my recommended... So the next level of headset, I'd say, is um, standalone devices. So you have the uh, Oculus Quest and... Um, Honestly, I don't even know if there are any more standalone devices out yet. I know HTC is just released today that they're working on a standalone device. But Oculus Quest and the Quest 2 are the two, only two ones that I know of that are actually standalone, So, which means they don't need a PC connected to it at all times. So as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection or the game is downloaded onto the actual headset, you can do that wirelessly. And the Oculus Quest 2 is either, uh, right now, either 300 or 400 US dollars to, uh, get into. And yeah, that's a pretty good all around headset. Like, I would definitely recommend that to anyone as their first VR headset. Um, it's Oculus, it's, it's Facebook. Facebook owns Oculus. And I think they have, 25% of the market in VR right now. Like if you look at all the total VR devices out right now, I think Oculus quest has about 25% of them, which is a good chunk. If you wanted to start developing like that, that would probably be the best, like, you know, go to, um, it's like when apps are released on the iPhone before they go to Android. Of course it's, I don't know what the, that split is anymore, <laughs> but, <laughs> and then if you wanted to go, uh, a little bit bigger and a little more. So you are limited with a standalone device as far as how much you can do in your game, as far as the visuals, the processing power, that kind of stuff, because it's a basically a really tiny computer compacted into that little headset. So if you want to actually develop for um, like a bigger, you know, AAA quality game, you'll need to do a, uh, what they call PC VR. So connected into your device that with a, a long cable, um, or you could stream wirelessly if you have like a, um, the both ends of the, uh, the wireless connection, which is pretty cool. Um, when, uh, when people hook that up, that is an interesting thing, but the, uh, you can get, so like half-life Alex just released last year around this time, maybe. And that was the, I think the second now, that was the first AAA game, I think, that was ever released in VR, which was like a crazy step. Um, and then Medal of Honor just released in VR after that. And I think those are the only two AAA games that we have in virtual reality right now. But both of those are PC VR games that are like crazy processing power. Um, I mean, you don't need like a ton of power, but it's definitely like you need a GPU in your computer. Um and like a, a decent amount of RAM and PC power and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's not for the uh, faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is I won't be able to get away with using my MacBook Air um, running, you know, was it four gigs of RAM, eight gigs of RAM? That Oof, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. You might, you might be able to, to stutter through some games. <laughs> Fair enough, fair enough. So we talked about the, you've said there quite a lot and we've talked about it as well, is that because you have to think of VR applications as being like games because they have all of those same, those same, um, all the, all of the things that make a game a game right. fit into VR, right? You've got a controller of some kind. Maybe it's those paddle controller things you get with one of the Oculuses. Or maybe, like you say, it's a game controller you hold in your hand and, you know, you're, you're interacting with a world in, you know, your standard CRUD app. You're not going to be interacting with the world. You're pushing a button. It pulls a record. You change some values. You push the record back into the database. Exactly. It's not the most exciting thing. <laughs> but if we could somehow virtualize that, that might be exciting. Uh, maybe I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> You're just dreaming too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I did once have uh, an idea of 
uh, to teach people how things like Google work. Um, to ha- the, the idea was you are a, 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 a packet of information, leaving a computer, going to, to some search engine, and then walking around the network, finding all of the things that you've got to, oh, well, there's this page, and there's that page, and there's that page, Ooh. and come almost like a, a detective game, and then bring that back to the user. But whether that would be actually useful, I don't know. But, you, know <laughs> you have to find the fun. <laughs> that's it, right? It's not really fun. Yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so... So in that case, then, what's the what are the basic elements of a VR? Like, as someone who has written, you know, a lot of VR stuff and enjoys doing it and sharing it with the world, what are some of the things that I need to put into my um, VR game, VR application to make the fun? Right? You said that you got to find the fun because if mm-hmm. it's not fun, no one's going to download it. Exactly. The so there's a, there's been a lot of games recently that have been ported over to. Um, virtual reality from you know a a flat screen game so like borderlands is one um doom 3 just got ported over to virtual reality um and so some more games and you can really tell the difference between when a game was made for vr versus you know it's just a, a ported flat screen console game and the one of the biggest rules that i have is you never take control of the player um, you always have to, and that's becoming more and more of a rule in, you know, just 3D first person shooters anyway. But, um, and that goes for cutscenes too. Like if you, it, and we, we actually learned a lot about that with the uh, Medal of Honor. The Medal of Honor was a game that took control of the player a lot of the time where you couldn't move. You just sat there and like there was like a cutscene going on around you, but your player couldn't move. Um, and then contrast that with Half-Life Alex, where when they, they had like a cutscene like element where there's like a lot of dialogue and story elements, they would just like confine you to like a little room. Like you could still like walk around and pick up stuff and like play around and listen if you wanted to or not, but you were never like taken control of, I guess. And so that, that was a, that was a big thing for me. Um, when I like got that contrast, I was like, Oh, okay. Th- this is how it's, you know, supposed to be is, um, I'm in the world and, uh, and even like, so like you're playing a shooting first person shooter game. Um, so they've got like, you know, a counter strike version of virtual reality basically. And, but when you get shot and, um, your player gets killed, your player will fall down, but you don't as a character. And so you kind of like kind of ghost out of the player and, because if you like actually were taken to the ground with the player, that would be super disorienting. Um, so th- there's a lot of elements like that you have to think about that you don't really think about. Um, cause like when you're playing a first person shooter game, like you can just have the character, like the camera can go with the character's head and fall on the ground and it'd be fine. Um, and then you can just cut away into cutscenes and it looks super cool. But when you're in virtual reality, the, I mean, the way the ported games do it is they just kind of space you back out into a 2D space. So it's almost like you're at an IMAX theater for the cutscene, and then they bring you back into the world. And it's just very jarring. Like you, I'm like, oh, like it reminds me that I'm playing a game. And I don't want to, I don't want to be reminded that I'm playing a game. I want to, you know, be in it and like be in the zone and like have to just like, you, you know, um, so that that's one of the biggest things. And then there's a game called Boneworks that was released, I think about a year ago too. And that one is their their one rule was everything is physics based. So a lot of early virtual reality games and even virtual reality games nowadays still, you can like your hand isn't really physics based. You can reach through walls and reach through um objects and flail around your hand on a desk, but nothing moves. But Boneworks was different. They like came up with this. The, I mean, the the one rule, and, and I think it was basically just like a tech demo. It wasn't even really a game. It was just like, can we make like a game that is just pure physics based? And it that's a, that's a crazy game to play because you can like use every bit of your environment for, um, as opposed to like a you know normal like con like a controller based game you have to walk around and find specific things that you need to interact with that have been pre-set up from the game. But 
like in Boneworks, you can literally grab anything and use it as a weapon. And <laughs> it's insane. Like you'd take this coffee cup and smash it over people's heads. And like, <laughs> um, you can grab, so they had these little like, uh, head crab type things or like little spiders that jump at you. And so I saw one guy grab both, like grab two spiders and then smash them into each other and like <laughs> killed them both just by smashing them into each other. Just like a ridiculous, like kind of like, like that's so cool. But then the development on that is a, th- a little bit easier too, because like you literally just make one class. That's like a, you know, make this physics based and pick up um, and then you give it like a mass. And if your character can pick up that amount of mass, then you can pick it up or um, some objects you need to pick up with two hands because you, only one hand can carry a certain amount of mass. Um, and then you just use the velocity to calculate the damage and you, there, there's your game. That's, <laughs> that's yeah, all the coding you need. You just set up the, um, the levels after that. So that that was cool. And going from that game to any other game where your hand can like, you know, go through, uh, go through walls and stuff. is just like the, basically I think, yeah, I think my biggest thing is just like, don't let the player know that they're in a game kind of thing. Like make it as real as possible. And a lot of games are like, you know, arcadey and get away with it. Um, or if you just have one really good, game mechanic like beat saber it's just one really good game mechanic that's fun and they've fine-tuned it to like a really good like even to the the way the haptics like vibrate when you touch your lightsabers together it's like it feels like you're like actually you know almost lightsaber fighting with yourself kind of thing Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah that one mechanic is really good and so boneworks's one mechanic was physics and um, after that i was like that needs to be the mechanic of every single VR game. <laughs> Maybe that's just my personal preference. I don't know. Um, yeah, it's it's complicated though because normally you you just like walk up to like this chest that you want to loot. You press a button on your controller, and your character goes through the animation. It it like freezes up the character for two or three seconds or however long it takes for that that looting animation to process. And then you come up and you have um, stuff in your inventory. But then in VR, you're like, well, how do I do an inventory? Because, like, <laughs> you, you can't just have this unlimited backpack of stuff. Like, I mean, I guess you can, but, like, a lot of VR games now will have, like, you, you have literal holsters that you need to reach down and grab a gun off of your holster, and you have a limited amount of space for holsters. Um, you have, like, both two thigh holsters and, like, shoulder holsters, and, like, that's all the space you have. And so you got to kind of prioritize what weapons you want to bring with you and that kind of stuff. Um, and, I mean, there, you could... Like it's a game, you can do whatever you want. You could um, make it so you could carry unlimited weapons, but like then you have to pull up like a UI kind of thing, and like that breaks your immersion. So like yeah, the virtual reality, you want to be fully immersed. Like that's kind of why you went into virtual reality. So that, that's my thought process behind that is to you know keep the player in the game and don't let them know they're there. <laughs> That makes sense, right? Like you said, you've gone down the route of make this virtual reality, so why take them out of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I like that. So, okay, so I need to explain to my boss why I need an Oculus, whatever it is, Oculus Rift, Oculus, whatever, so that I can play around with it and build enterprise applications. (laughs) How do I do that? (laughs) Actually, coincidentally, I was skiing like a month or two ago and while i was waiting in line for the ski lift this really chatty guy comes up to me and just starts talking to me and so i'm like okay i humor him and somehow we got on the topic of virtual reality maybe i don't know (laughs) you could call me an evangelist (laughs) but (laughs) he was like yeah we use that and he um turns out he was like a miner for uh, minerals and uh, so, I mean, nowadays they use the huge giant construction equipment and it's millions and millions of dollars to buy and to run and all this kind of stuff, huge expensive equipment. And he's like, oh, yeah, we use virtual reality to train our um, workers on that, because if we have this newbie go and operate this million dollar piece of equipment, like I don't like it's we're not making our money back from it while that guy's learning. And like, it's not like we can just have an extra one come out here and like to use for 
training purposes. So they put people in virtual reality and have them learn the you know, operating procedures and the steps to do it. And it's nice because like when you're in virtual reality, you can have a floating checklist beside you and you can make sure that you did all the things right. And uh, we got to talking a little bit and he was saying that they they were looking at making the machines like fully virtual like what if we just instead of like we just replace the human put a 360 camera where the human's supposed to be or even just play, place cameras like over where the the digger is so you're more precise with the digger um or the saw or whatever the machine has on it and like that kind of thing um and then the guy could just work from home like you just, you're at home you got a good you got a good wi-fi connection you uh put on a virtual reality headset and you're at work like digging you know with uh, all the controls and you can do all the things um but i work for a consulting company and so we have a lot of different projects and so um they found out about my virtual reality youtube channel and stuff and they're like well if you can make a uh a virtual reality version of the office and like have people be able to like come and interact with it and that kind of stuff like we could probably pitch this as like a um, training kind of software. Like this would just be like a good prototype for a training software. Like, um, let's say you want to like train an ele electrician or something. Um, and like, what, what are the different steps you need to do to wire this particular thing or debug wire this like thing? Like, I don't know, lots of different, like, um, physical kind of applications. I was trying to come up with a way, like, like coders and programmers like us could like use it. But um, the best the the best I can come up with is like um, just having more monitors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. One of my uh, when I first started hearing about the virtual reality, the proper virtual reality headsets, I was like, "Cool, I can ditch my monitors and just have everything on in in front of my eyes. Uh -huh. Literally move my head around and find that other file where there it is. Okay, yeah. now I'm looking over here. I'm gonna type into that file. I'm gonna look over there." Over to my left, there's that file. I'm going to type in there. Look over here. Oh, right. Okay, there's that file. Uh -huh. That's literally behind that one. So maybe yeah. I grab maybe it. Maybe minority it. report. <laughs> yeah, right. Maybe that's what I Because then who cares about screen space, right? You yeah, exactly. You've got screen space you I need. never have to close the tab again. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's it. Maybe you they can have, uh, Google. And they actually do have an application, um, Immersed VR is a... Uh, one of the there, there's a couple immersive VR is the one that I keep seeing ads for, um, but there so, and I tried out their uh, free version, but the uh, the difficult part about that is um, you still need a keyboard, and when you're in virtual reality, you all you can do is touch type, um, and so the uh, the Oculus Quest so most virtual reality headsets have controllers attached to them, um, but they've just started coming out with so the Oculus Quest Two has full hand tracking so you don't need a controller so you ba different hands motions will trigger different actions which is really cool and convenient, but it adds a little different element too because I can use a keyboard now I don't need controllers to control the windows I can reach out and grab the windows with my hand and throw them across the screen. But I can also have a mouse and keyboard in front of me. And the Oculus is, I think they're still developing a, basically a pass through. So I could look down and see um, almost like a little window into the real world down below me. And I could put my mouse and my keyboard in that little window where my big mouse pad is. And then I could always like see where my keys and where my hands are for like typing and stuff. Because that's, that was, that's probably been my biggest issue with virtual reality is I can't type. Um, and the, uh, the accuracy is you can't get really like fine tuned accuracy. So if I'm, I'm trying to code and like I have an error on line 171 and I'm trying to click on it, but like, it's, is it, am I going to click on that line? Where am I going to click on the line? Um, it's not very precise. So I need, I still need that mouse and keyboard. I still need those extra controls, but I also want to be able to like, you know, turn around and grab a window from the side kind of stuff. Um, so immersed is kind of, uh, overcome that by, if you have a Bluetooth keyboard, it'll, um, they'll, they'll have like a virtual keyboard that'll mirror your actual keyboard position and everything which is nice um but once oculus's pass through little real world window comes out that's gonna be i might i might just ditch the monitors and <laughs> uh, i'll just have a, a beefed up pc and like an empty desk <laughs> yeah <why laughs> with <not>? a keyboard <laughs> i think that'd be super cool 
Yeah, yeah. And then you never have to worry about like, uh, well, what if they can see through your window and see the code you're working on? Well, I ain't got no monitors <laughs> yeah. now. You can't see nothing. <laughs> but pitch yeah. it to your boss as that, right? Secure code, secure code. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no one will be able to look over my shoulder. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course, that, that, that brings in the question of how would you do a pair or I believe... I believe we're walking away from the term mob programming. I may be wrong about that, but like group programming, how would you get around that? I guess you'd have to just bring someone into your VR session and they can maybe walk around your office, yeah. and stand behind you. But then they, they have know. like a chat room kind of vibes to it. Yeah. Mm. The, you can't, so some of those, I think immersed even does it. They have a, um, that, that's their paid version. You gotta, if you want more people, you know, you can have a room and like I can share my screen with you. Um, and I've actually, uh, showed up on a couple of zoom calls where, uh, in a application and it's, uh, this application is called big, big screen TV. Um, I think it's big, big screen, just big screen. Um, but basically it's, it's main purpose is like for movie watching. So you are like in this virtual theater and you can, um, but it mirrors your desktop. So I can play Netflix on my PC and it'll look like I'm sitting at a movie theater watching this movie, which is super cool, but I've used it for, um, I, you can have multiple monitors up, but then also there's a selfie camera in it and so i've used that camera as my zoom camera <laughs> so i've had a uh like a it, it gives you like an avatar um like a little like cartoonish kind of avatar and so and it's like a selfie camera so i'm like holding it up walking around this little like office that i have and like <laughs> You could see my giant monitors behind me and I'm like looking around and like walking around. It almost looks like I'm just holding a cell phone walking around this apartment, but it's like this cartoon character and it's hilarious. And it like really like when I like get on, like all the conversation stops and they're like, what, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's super cool. Um, but yeah, the, the, I mean, it's still gimmicky, but I feel like once we get to like VR, like to a place where it's actually like the standard for work, like, I mean, it's very like, you know, pre internet, like 90s internet, where like it's a cool thing, but like no one really uses it. Like, there's no reason for me to have an email. Like, it's just cool. Like, I can email my friends, but like until you need an email for work or you need VR for work, like, there's not really like going to be much of a point for like much development. Actually, uh, Microsoft just signed a $22 billion contract with the military to give them, them augmented reality um, glasses, which is a super big step forward in the, the virtual reality, uh, augmented reality world, because that, that's going to be some heavy duty development going in, going on over there, which is super cool. I wonder whether... So you, you talked about the, the sort of big picture because I, my brother has that on his, um, Oculus, whatever. I keep saying Oculus. Obviously, this is not sponsored by, <laughs> but you know, they're the big name. So yeah. yeah. So my brother has the Oculus, whatever, and he has a similar app. I don't know whether it's the same or not, but yeah, he's sitting, he's sitting in the middle of a movie theater and watches whatever film his, his PC is watching. Yeah. But the way that you said that you have it set up, I wonder whether that could help, like, so there were, one of the things I've noticed over the last, um, let's call it year or so of, uh, everybody working online is that a lot of people are, re I feel like reticence is the wrong word, reluctant to, um, have a camera pointing at them whilst they're talking to a screen full of people, right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps the system that you've just described there could help those, those people feel a little more comfortable with that. They can design their own character, design yeah. their, their own backdrop, and they can have, you know, whatever they need to. If they indeed wanted to do that, I'm not saying that they should, but, you know, if mm -hmm. you are, if you are, I, I, I'm worried that if I say, um, in, uh, introverted, that may be the wrong word. But let's say, let's say that I don't like to be on camera and I've got a big Zoom meeting coming up or, or big Teams meeting or whatever, big meeting coming up and I have to give a presentation. Well, as long as it's not a super professional, I'm talking to another company, I'm trying to sell services to that company. If it's an inter-company inter meeting, 
I could totally get away with, yeah, this is my little cartoon avatar because yeah. that's how I do my meetings, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you can have like more realistic type, like the, I'm sure there'll be d- um, applications that let you um, put in like a more like, you know, visually aesthetic, like almost real, real looking person unit. I think it, no, Unreal Engine just came out with a thing called the Meta Human, and it is basically just a software that lets you create like humans, um, see like CGI humans, but it is so lifelike. It is crazy, like crazy similarities. And, um, if you just like kind of are scrolling through YouTube and glance at like the, um, picture and whatever, it, it looks like it's real people, but I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. That's CGI. That's crazy. <laughs> and it's like real time, um, mimics your lip movement and uh, like the facial tracking and everything. Super cool. But a lot of uh, streamers have started to do that. So live streamers will who want to re- remain anonymous, mm. um, but like you can't really live stream and not be on camera. It's a very difficult thing to do. Like you can just like you know play this game um, and you know be good at the game, but like you have to ha- you have to have a personality and be on there and be there. And a lot of people um, are starting to stream with these virtual avatars, and so they're they're called they're called um, v VTubers um, or uh, yeah vir- just virtual people. But uh, it's it's super cool, super crazy kind of the motion tracking and they'll buy like whole like motion tracking suits. So like the, instead of just having your head and controllers, you have a entire like body motion tracking, which is super cool. Um, and I've actually thought about doing that. And like, what if I just like, you know, I can live stream almost like I'm having a zoom call, but like be w- inside of a game. And so like mm-hmm. the, the people watching can kind of also interact with the game and like have monsters pop up and like that kind of stuff. Like, I feel like that'd be pretty cool. But it's definitely a thing, definitely a thing that's coming um, as far as like people who like want to remain anonymous on the Internet. You can have like virtual avatars and all that kind of stuff, too. Now, that's really cool. I I like that. I like because like I feel like that helps with. I'm worried about saying accessibility, but like that, that ex- less accessibility is in I can access, like if I am uh, hard of hearing or if I'm, if I, if I need a screen reader, it's less that kind of accessibility, but more, um, access to the actual technology. If I want to be a live streamer, because maybe I'm the best person in the world at playing a game or I'm the best. I want to do some, maybe some live coding, but I'm, mm-hmm. I'm worried about how I come across on camera. Maybe I don't like the way I look. Maybe I don't want a camera in my face. Maybe, you know, there's some reason for me not to want to do that. Then the technology is there to help me, right? I, exactly. can, I can use that to actually, like you say, anonymize myself or change, create my own little avatar or create a super realistic other sort of person. You know, because mm-hmm. I often wonder about some of these live streamers, you know, the, the, the big, the big names, they must get people coming up to them in the street going, Oh my goodness, it's you. It's, oh, yeah. it's whoever. You're like you don't have any like seclusion or anything anymore. Like you, you can't go to the grocery store without people wanting your autograph and whatnot, your celebrity mm-hmm. status. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Nice. Definitely a thing that could, could help with that. Okay. I I liked the idea that you said earlier on about having like a virtual office as well, where you, you use the example of maybe we can use it, you know, you, I'm not trying to steal your company's IP or whatever, but you could use it <laughs> as like a tech demo for training people to do things. Or perhaps uh-huh. what about um I want to interact with my colleagues, I'll put on the VR headset, we'll all go into the office and we'll just stand mm-hmm. around at the water cooler or we'll go and make a coffee at the coffee machine or, you know, we'll just have like a breakout exactly. session. Exactly. We'll throw some ideas around. Well, I've got my controllers. I can write on the, on the, on the board, on the, uh, you know, the dry wipe board or the whiteboard, whatever you want to call it. We can literally draw block diagrams for how we're going to do things, move the cards around. I'm in the office for all intents and purposes. Uh-huh. Right? It you just, know, what's going to uh, be really cool right? is when they combine the, uh, 
when the Microsoft HoloLens augmented reality stuff and virtual reality. And so everyone who actually goes into the office is wearing a augmented reality glasses. And then everyone who's not in the office is virtual VR headset. And you can all see each other walking around the office. You can see each other writing on the whiteboards. It like shows up virtually. Uh, that's that's going to be crazy. That's going to be super cool. <laughs> I can imagine there being a lot of, I mentioned earlier on a silly, you reach out and fall on your face. Maybe that could happen. You know, you go up to someone, you know, you're going to pat them on the back and say, Hey, it's great to see you. Reach out to shake their hand and fall over. You know, that's like the- forget they're the virtual <laughs> yeah. person. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. The fidelity is going to be like good enough. You walk, you just walk through people or you're used to like walking through people for fun. And then you'd actually run into a person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, oh man, yeah, oh cool. No, that that's awesome. So, um, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've we've discussed a lot of the of the applications, and we've discussed a little bit about getting started as well. So, you would recommend for at least for .NET devs get started with Unity. You can maybe use your phone if you need to. If you mm-hmm. want to lay out some money, there's some devices you can buy, and you don't really need a super powerful computer. Yeah, yeah. What, you, what I've gotten from this. That's that's awesome. I, yeah. I like that. I as long as you can run Unity, you're I think you're good. Awesome. That they that that's 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 the best news because like you know, as long as I can as long as I can run it, I can build it. And mm-hmm. you know, maybe I don't have maybe I don't have the most powerful computer, but as long as it can run the tools and then I offload the the processing to the actual virtual reality hardware yeah, exactly. i don't need to worry about i gotta go I, so i've got to get a thousand dollars worth of computer i've got to get two thousand dollars worth of headsets i've got to move into a new apartment because the room <laughs> I'm in is not big enough I need space yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i just moved into a bigger room so i could have some more uh, walk around space <laughs> no that's good that's good I, I like the ability to sort of start again I, i'm trying to I'm trying to be more um, careful with my words. I don't want to say start small, but you don't have to jump straight into spending thousands of sorry, spending thousands of dollars, having a massive space to work in, having having essentially a supercomputer. You can just mm-hmm. start with what you have and build up. I like right. That. Try it, see if you like it, and uh, if if it's something that you see yourself getting into, then you can start out at a, one of the entry level headsets or. Uh, just using your phone for a little bit. And if that's cool, then you can just start to upgrade and end up with a super big computer and multiple headsets like I do now. <laughs> Cause I, <laughs> I get the bug bit me and here I am. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so what's the best way for folks to, cause you mentioned earlier on that you do a YouTube channel. Um, is it YouTube and Twitter or how, how can people sort of follow the progress? What, what, and, and how would you recommend people start? Do you recommend they load up your channel, go to video number one and watch from there? <laughs> or is there like Could a be. getting started? Uh, you know, the, how, how do they get started? Virtual reality is a, uh, I mean, at its heart, we talked about that it's a, it's a video game. So if you're going to start developing for virtual reality applications, you have to know how to code or be comfortable with a visual scripting kind of language like that. And, um, you also need to, uh, know how to make a game and, uh, it could just be a 2d game, a 3d, like first person shooter type game or anything like that, because a lot of the mechanics are still the same after you get past the, uh, the weird inputs that virtual reality has in the end, you still have missions and goals and, um, different objectives and interactions and that kind of stuff that a normal 2d, 3d game would have. So you, you have to have those, um, skills down as well. Um, and then you, so I would almost recommend learning how to do game development first, um, at least get like a good grasp of that and then switching over to virtual reality. Cause if you just jump straight into virtual reality, that is, uh, diving in the deep end there <laughs> because it's super complicated and technical at first. And you're like, Oh, what am I do- Why am I doing this? I'm like, Oh, well, so you can, you know, interact with different stuff and, uh, you do the normal video game stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, you could find me. I do, uh, so I do a lot of virtual reality specific tutorials. Um, there's a lot of game dev tutorials already out there. So I didn't ended up not going that route, but I do like, okay, well, how do you jump? How is that different in virtual reality than, you know, in a third person 
video game or, uh, you know, how do you grab objects? Because that's a specific kind of virtual reality thing. So I, I have a YouTube channel. My name's Justin P. Barnett. You can find me under that. And uh, I talk about a lot of virtual reality applications for, um, well, I'm doing a lot of mechanics now, but I think um, in the future, I'm going to start doing like uh, dev reviews of different games that are out, um, more podcasts. I want to kind of, you know, branch out, try a bunch of different things. Um, and if you want to chat, you can find me on Twitter, also Justin P. Barnett. Um, and uh, yeah, those, those are the two best ways. I'm also on LinkedIn and all the other things. But uh, if you want to get a hold of me, those are the two best ways. <laughs> sure. Okay. So just then to, because uh, obviously what I'll do is I'll put... I'll put links to all of these in the show notes and make sure you click through to those. Um, but uh, let's say I go and buy a, a HTC Oculus, right? I keep saying Oculus. Let's, let's mix it up. I, I buy, <laughs> I, buy uh, I don't know, Walmart's um, a virtual reality headset or whatever, <laughs> right? And I've got it hooked up and I'm ready to go and I want to learn, right, okay, Justin, Get me started. What's the first video I should watch? Because obviously I'm gonna I'm gonna hit your channel. There's gonna be lots of videos. Mm-hmm. Do you have a recommended sort of first, uh, almost like beginners setup, or is there like I don't want to say newbie because I'm worried about you know the connotations of that. I, like I said, uh-huh. I'm be conscious of my language. But have you got a video that's like okay, so you've just got the device, you have just installed Unity, let's get started, or uh-huh. is it just? Yep. Right, let's let's create a particle physics, or let's create a drill, or let's create um, a thing where you can throw a ball. Like, what's where do I start with your with I've your? Yeah, two videos I'd recommend. So one, if you are just thinking about getting into it, I have a video um, about um, what do I need to like make virtual reality games and stuff, and that'll talk a little more in depth about different headsets, which one you should get, the price points, um, different game engines, different. Um, you know, 3D modeling software that you would need if you want to go that route, or if you just want to buy 3D models like I do, <laughs> or get the free ones. Um, it, so basically, it, it'll go through like what, what's all the equipment that I need and what's all the software that I need. Um, so that's that video, how to make VR games, and then um, how to start a VR game is another video that I have that actually walks through. Okay, so we have Unity installed and we have a VR headset. Um, let's go step by step and make a like blank th- 3d game VR that I can just, you know, walk around in. Like, how do I just like start from scratch? And then from there, all my other tutorials will kind of build off of that one video where w- once you have the basics down, um, and a, and a lot of the tutorials, I kind of will start from scratch. I'll go quick and be like, all right, well, you need to, you know, this plugin and this SDK and all this kind of stuff to like get the project going. Um, so you could usually jump into any of my videos and, um, get started, but that, that one had a start VR in 2021 is my uh, most recent up to vi- up to date video <laughs> um and uh that that would be a good spot to start awesome awesome well uh what have i got to say justin this has been an amazing conversation i uh, i i want to go out and buy a vr headset now and, and build something i think it would be quite interesting to uh to be able to send something over the wire to my brother and go hey install that on your on your uh-huh. whatever and he's just walking around and goes wait a minute you're in this how do you do this <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think vr is going to replace the the phone like people aren't gonna have phones anymore it's just gonna be like a you'll have this ar headset like you just have glasses um like you're wearing right now just like thin like reading glasses almost and you can like project netflix onto the wall like people won't have tvs anymore and you just project what netflix on that wall and if i'm watching it with my wife i can just share with her and we could both be watching netflix on the same wall in virtual space, like kind of thing, it's just absolutely crazy. So, like, and like all my message and notifications and stuff will be there. So, um, if you if you're not getting into VR now with the very cutting edge, you will be in the next ten or fifteen years, I'm sure. So, <laughs> cool, cool. So you heard it here first, folks. Justin is going to teach you VR, and you're going to be awesome at it because Justin's the best. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> awesome well like i said justin thanks for being on the show um i'll put loads of links to all of the stuff so i may have to ask you uh, off air to send me some links and stuff but i'll i'll make sure they're all in the show notes and uh yeah thanks ever so much for for talking it's been super exciting to hear this is this is what i love about the podcast right so uh-huh. what i love about doing this show is i get to meet people who are so excited about the technologies that they're 
I use the word play, right? But I don't mean like playing around. I mean like, right, actual, right. let's see what we can build. I'm so, I'm so, um, enamored with people when they're so excited about, let's do this thing. Check this out. Watch right. Like, this, it's so right? fun. This is so cool. Yeah. Right. All the, all the different stuff I can do. Like I try to tell my wife about it and she's like, I don't know. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine, dear. I'm watching yeah, Netflix. Ex- exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, can you help me hang this picture over here? <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can build a VR application. We yeah. can hang all the pictures you want. Yeah, here's glasses. You can just f- put whatever <laughs> picture you want. The, the picture looks different for me than it does for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe you can use Google to pull, I don't know, a picture uh-huh. of the day. I think that's like, actually a thing that Bill Gates has. Like he like has like a lapel that he wears um, in his house, and so when he walks into a room, all the pictures change the ones that he likes. And when his wife walks in the room, all the pictures change to like a th- the pictures that she likes. It'll be like <laughs> it'll be like that in, in VR. <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. like I'm super excited for this technology to like get off the ground and start running. But like we just need like more people to get into it, start making stuff, and it's I could feel the wave start to build a little bit like it, this year and last year like i feel like it's starting to especially with everyone being revert remote and v- virtual um it's starting to like gain popularity and this new the oculus quest coming out um but yeah we just need more developers just making stuff trying stuff out because uh it's if you if you get in it now you could probably like you'd be the uh the guy to go to here in the next five, 10 years. Um, once everything starts to shift over, Facebook has a fifth of its employees working on virtual reality wow. development, which is <laughs> insane. They have like, I think something like 60,000 employees now, and a fifth of them are working on some kind of virtual reality application development. Wow. It's gonna be crazy. That is, that is cool. Excellent. Well, with that bombshell, <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, no, it's it's been a lot of fun. Um, I really appreciate you being on yeah. the show, Justin. Thanks for having me on. This has been super cool. No worries. No worries. It's, it has been a lot of fun. But yes, it, has, it is time to say goodbye. So uh, uh, I guess see you next time. I mean, let, maybe maybe we can have you back on the show in a couple of months. See what you've built. Maybe in a couple. Oh yeah, that'd be super six cool. Six months, a year, or something like that. Let's see what. See what. See what. Totally we can build. down. Excellent. Oh yeah. Excellent. Well, that being said, thank you ever so much, Justin. And uh, yeah, catch you again. See ya. See ya. That was my interview with Justin Barnett about building virtual reality applications in .NET using the Unity game engine. Be sure to check out the show notes for a bunch of links to some of the stuff that we covered and a full transcription of the interview. The show notes, as always, can be found at .netcore.show and there will be a link directly to them in your podcatcher. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave me a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice. Uh, Head over to .netcore.show forward slash subscribe for ways to do that. And to come back next time for more .net goodness. See you again real soon. See you later, folks. .NET Core Podcast is a production of RJJ Software Limited.